Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and you're looking at a planet known as K218b. And in this video we're going to be talking about the idea of so-called supercritical planets. Planets where gas and liquid kind of become one and create these very unusual physical properties that are very similar to some of the objects we have here in the solar system. Let's talk about this and welcome to What The Math. Today's video is based on this study, you can find it in the description below, but the idea here is somewhat interesting and I guess in some sense somewhat complicated. So to explain it, let's look at some of the experiments we've conducted here on Earth to try to establish what supercritical fluids are like. In this video from UCSC Physics, you can kind of see how supercriticality becomes very very common here on the planet if you were to put water in a very specific condition. Specifically here, the pressure and the temperatures have to be low enough for water to reach so-called triple point, where it can actually behave as liquid, gas and solid all at the same time. And this is what you're looking at here. It's water, but it's water like you've never seen it before. So this is what we call supercriticality. It's when a substance starts to have two different physical properties at the same time, sometimes even three, like in this case. But although reaching a triple point is somewhat difficult because it requires a very certain pressure and very certain temperature, reaching the so-called supercritical fluid stage, where water behaves as gas and liquid at the same time, is a lot easier. As a matter of fact, if you were to go deep into the ocean and find one of the so-called hydrothermal vents that you see right here, we actually have quite a lot of them around the oceans, some of the hydrothermal vents right at this spot right here start creating a lot of supercritical fluid effects. And this essentially means that gas starts to act like fluid and fluid starts to act like gas. This creates a lot of unusual properties for these uh, hydrothermal vents, but more specifically it actually helps them dissolve a lot of different matter, bringing them out into the water, and thus delivering a lot of food for all sorts of marine life that usually thrives near these hydrothermal vents. But we've even found a way to use these supercritical fluids for different industries, like for example for oil extraction where supercritical fluids are used to try to push some of the oil from within the ground. Normally carbon dioxide uh, supercritical fluids are used for this, but we can also use water. But it's still kind of difficult to really imagine how this behaves and what it does, because technically it's really gas that behaves like fluid. It's a gas that can dissolve things just as well as fluid, and it does have very fluid-like properties, but still acts like a gas as well. But today we know that supercritical fluids are absolutely crucial for even possibly creation of life, like we see right here from an example of a hydrothermal vent. They also seem to be important in helping planets shape themselves. The best example of how supercritical fluids can shape a planet comes from the nearest planet to us, our neighbor Venus. So here, if we were to look under the atmosphere, we would actually discover a very unusual and somewhat difficult to imagine surface of a planet where it's very possible that the carbon dioxide here acts like a supercritical fluid. Now, we know that Venus today spins extremely slow. As a matter of fact, its rotation is so slow that it takes uh, one day here longer than one year on Venus. And most scientists today believe that this was actually caused by some kind of a very large global liquid that used to be present on the surface of Venus. Now the theory on this is still not entirely clear, but one of the best explanations here is in regards to CO2 being a supercritical fluid that essentially covered the entire surface of Venus and eventually caused it to slow down its rotation. And the simulations that were run on Venus suggest that, well essentially a long time ago, it's very likely there was even more pressure and possibly even more temperature here, and so CO2 was even more prominent and had these really really large ocean-like deposits of supercritical fluid on the surface that acted both as gas and fluid, and because of extremely complex atmospheric effects and also seasonal changes, the gas itself, the supercritical fluid gas, would change into fluid more frequently than gas, and this would actually slowly cause the planet to slow down and eventually stop. A lot of this had to do with the tidal effects Venus received from the Sun, because it's much closer to the Sun, so in some sense it's very similar to why Earth is slowing down today because of the Moon as well. But these studies also suggest that the conditions on Venus were a lot more extreme in the past and also very likely changed very frequently and quite fast as well. In other words, Venus was probably a lot denser before and had a lot more supercritical fluid than it does today. Right now, if we were to go there, we would probably discover these 
very large bubbles of supercritical fluid on the surface, most likely in some of the deeper regions of the planet, but most of the CO2 here will still just be really, really hot pressurized gas. It's not going to be supercritical. But even in the current conditions on Venus, with the pressure of about 93 atmospheres and very high temperatures, we technically already have this critical point of uh, carbon dioxide. So in other words, even today, Venus is probably still filled with these supercritical uh, lakes somewhere on the surface in some of the deeper parts of the planet. Which of course means that if you were to stand on the surface here, and if you were to survive long enough to be able to witness what's happening, you would probably be in almost liquid-like conditions, you could probably even swim in these conditions, except that obviously it's very very hot and has a lot of pressure. But other than that, we always believe that Venus used to be very Earth-like. As a matter of fact, many studies do suggest that possibly water and even Earth-like conditions were present here a long time ago, and we know that there's quite a lot of nitrogen, very similar to planet Earth as well. So very Earth-like atmospheric conditions were quite possible. So today, a lot of research does kind of suggest that Venus went from this to this, mostly because of fluid effects, specifically very likely supercritical fluids on the surface. Which takes us back to the original planet I showed you in the beginning, so-called K218b. It was discovered a few years ago and a lot of scientists got really excited because it was in the habitable zone of its planet, it was also what's known as a super earth, so it very likely had at least some water on the surface. And the thing is, water vapor was eventually found here. This was the first exoplanet discovered that had confirmed water. And so a lot of scientists started to speculate maybe this is actually an earth-like planet with a very earth-like conditions. But it was still a little bit too large to be an earth-like planet and it did have a little bit more mass than earth. So some of the original simulations made it kind of look like this, like this very giant Neptune-like world, possibly even some kind of a super ocean world. And a lot of papers started to be published uh, suggesting that many of these objects we've been discovering are possibly extremely large ocean planets, which of course gave us a lot of hope that we're going to discover another Earth-like planet somewhere out there. But some of the recent papers started to argue against that. And the most recent paper went even a little bit farther and proved that a lot of these so-called ocean worlds, super ocean worlds, these very large super earth planets and habitable zones might actually in reality be filled to the brim with these super critical water. Essentially kind of like Venus, but instead of CO2, here we have super critical water, very similar to what you're seeing right here, except that much hotter and under a lot more pressure and without the solid state, only gas and liquid. And so what a lot of these simulations from this paper suggest is that most of these worlds we've discovered so far, the ones we got super excited about, are very likely terrestrial worlds, possibly even similar to Venus, but with a very large envelope of supercritical fluid on the surface. And the analysis of several planets here suggested that if we were to assume that these planets had supercritical fluid on the surface, it would explain all of the observations we're seeing, including the water vapor. But instead of being Venus-like, or obviously Earth-like, these objects would be essentially, well, I guess in some sense you can call them sauna planets. They would be super super hot on the inside, have very high pressures on the inside, but at the same time the water here would be able to dissolve pretty much anything, so it's very difficult to imagine what kind of a surface these objects would even have. And because we know that water becomes super critical at around 650 degrees Kelvin and about 22 atmospheres of pressure, many of these worlds could easily have these conditions on the inside, assuming that they are in the location where we've discovered them, where they can receive just enough sunlight to heat up, and also have very powerful greenhouse effects to take this temperature even further. But I guess what's really unusual here is that these are not really rocky planets and they're not really liquid planets, they're not water worlds. They are literally something in between. They're sort of like supercritical fluid planets. And all of the puffiness and large radius we've observed from these planets is also probably because of the effects from the supercritical water that does essentially turn into vapor and will basically turn the planet into a very large vapor bowl. And the more puffy the planet is, the more likely it has even more water on the inside. And so even though you could still call these water worlds, they're not really water ocean worlds. They are supercritical water worlds. A world somewhat similar to what Venus may have been in the past, but obviously something that's very difficult for us to imagine. And this also suggests that even though originally we thought that maybe some of these worlds have a very large envelope of hydrogen and helium similar to Neptune and Uranus, in reality, that envelope might be water vapor. 
and they might be water worlds after all, just not the type we imagined. Now, unfortunately, other than simulating and other than using um, physical calculations here on Earth, there is really no other way for us to prove or disprove this right now until further telescopes come out and are able to see these planets in a little bit more detail. And if this is what these planets are like, it would be actually really interesting to find out what effects this causes on the planet itself. Just like Venus, maybe they also have extremely slow spin, they could also be extremely hot, but at the same time, maybe they actually have very different effects and have extremely different conditions to what we can now imagine. So these planets in the long term might become extremely important for us to study in order to understand how different planets evolve over time and also what we need to actually find to find life somewhere out there or to find another wonderful planet similar to planet Earth. But I guess until we discover more, that's all I wanted to mention in this video. Thank you for watching, subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, and maybe come back tomorrow to learn something else. You can also check out the paper in the description below, and also consider supporting this channel on Patreon because it does help me quite a lot, or support this channel by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can also find in the description below. I'll see you tomorrow, space out, and as always, bye bye.